So I remember reading that The Cluck and Chicken was the first time you got to work with Robert Smigel and that it was just dreadful. It was a disaster, as a matter of fact. Um, that was from... Those kids are probably... They probably own their own corporation right now. It was 1992, and it was the first time that... Uh, I had done anything with SNL, and a friend of mine who, Jim Signorelli, who's over there, um, handled all the live-action parodies. And Robert had written this script, and um, it sounded great. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Um, <laughs> They're all panicking back there. <laughs> Um, so Robert had never done, Saturday Night Live hadn't really done a lot of animation. And uh, um, Robert certainly hadn't done any animation before. And the way things work over there is the writers are given the responsibility of producing their own work because Lauren Michael, Michaels feels that if you're going to fall on your ass, you should you know, do it yourself. You shouldn't be able to blame anyone else. So... Um, we had, uh, I had designed the characters, and 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 um, we had gotten the live action to match all the animation to, and we had uh, supposedly gotten all the sign offs, and then um, we finished the animation. And this is when we were still painting on cells and and doing these complicated uh, composites with video and and film, and we finished everything and. Robert saw it and said, no, I want, I want the eyes to go the other way. And uh, we had had a, a few heated conversations before then, but that, I just lost it. And I said terrible things to him that I've never said to this day to anyone. And uh, so I was convinced, even though we had a wonderful piece to show, and, and it was great because most of our work up to that point was commercials. So to have something that was a parody that was on Saturday Night Live to show was just phenomenal, but I was convinced there was no way I was ever going to work with Robert Smigel again. Um, a few, maybe a year later, um, we got a call from NBC um, saying that they were going to start this new late night show because Letterman had, uh, I guess, jumped over to CBS uh, starring this guy, Conan O'Brien. Um, and they were contemplating doing some animation for the opening titles. So I go over to NBC, and I, I meet Conan, and I meet Jeff Ross, his producer, and we start talking about stuff, and Robert walks in. And, and in my own kind of time to get a life head, I'm thinking, oh, this is a setup. <laughs> and uh, so we're talking more about doing this, this animation around, you know, it could be something very simple, line with some, maybe some color, I don't know. And I said, hold it, really, do you really want to do this again? <laughs> I mean, I really, I'm, I can apologize now, there's it's like water under the bridge, but I said some god-awful things to you. And I really, you know, I feel terrible about it, and I don't want to go into a working collaboration and end up, and he just looked at me and went, everyone says that to me. <laughs> so um, from that point on, Everything was cool and got to do some of the best work, not only the studio's best work. And we only did the first three seasons of SNL. Um, it was an all-consuming sort of um, uh, production scenario because those, some of those things were turned around in a week and a half. And the, the, the Casablanca piece was, I think, less than a week and a half. Uh, but the variety the um, the visibility, and most of all, how it got to kind of change people's perception of what animation was and was supposed to be. That was the best thing about it, because pe people could finally, for sure, look at animation as something other than ducks and bunnies. And uh, any time we had an opportunity to do that, I wanted to you know try to do that. So it was it, it was great. Opened a lot of doors. So um, let's go back um, a little bit to the beginning. Uh, you didn't 
study animation. It's not something you went to school for. You didn't start out thinking you'd be an animator. No, I always loved cartoons, but I don't think I ever thought that working in animated cartoons or animation was even a possibility. Um, I was interested in drawing. I was interested in comic books. Um, and then must have been, a, uh, I was still in high school, and there was this film festival at Northwestern. And they showed these Superman cartoons that had been done by the Fleischers. You ever seen those? When I was a kid, I'd never seen those. I had no exposure to those whatsoever. So at this animation film festival, here was this, and it was black and white, but I knew because of the breakdown of the tones that it must have been in color. And it was like, where did this come from? Um, and it was the first one with this electric ray. And the, God, the animation was terrific. The design was terrific. And I, from what I could get out of it, I, uh, this was something I really wanted to look into more. I was able to track down some 16 millimeter prints and I got like three copies of um, different cartoons that were done and studied them and loved them. And, and then when I went away to school um, in drawing classes, I would find different ways of incorporating variations of animation into stuff I do. Like if, if we had a drawing assignment that maybe had a sequence of stuff, I'd, I'd maybe use a, f a flip book. Um, and, and in Madison, I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, yeah. <laughs> Michigan sucks. Uh, there, um, there was no animation department. Um, so I would look for, again, in drawing classes, I'd look for opportunities to try my own animation or I would um, uh, in, I, I, in take film courses. And I, I was able to find some animation ex exposure to the craft. Um, when it came time to leaving, for leaving school, I thought I'll either go to California for animation, because that's where all the animation is, or I'll go to New York for comic books. And because I had family in New York and I was familiar with New York, went to New York and then found out there was animation there. And then hooked up with some people who saw some potential in my work in the animation realm and started working on wonderful things like Strawberry Shortcake and Big Apple City and <laughs> Berenstain Bears. Classics. But it was, it was great. It was great because I was working with people who were in the industry, in some cases, early 30s, now Fleischer, at, Disney. At least one of those people told you get out while you can because this is a dying art, right? First day on the job, this guy <laughs> comes up to me and says, uh, oh, you new here? And uh, it's like, somebody's actually talking to me. I said, you know, yeah, this is my first day. He said, you want some advice from an old timer? And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is great. <laughs> I said, sure. He said, there's the elevator, get out, run, go, this is, we're all dying. And it, I ended up working exclusively with that guy. His name was Jan Spochak, and he, for years, animated Punchy for Hawaiian Punch. And he had this great way of working. And everybody used to, to, to bust his chops because he was slow, but his stuff was never revised. All these other guys would crank out the shit really quick, and uh, their stuff would come back three, four times, but they got the footage done quick. Jan's stuff... It was so I got to actually assist him, and it was as his only assistant, and he was the only guy I worked for for about nine months, and it was the most wonderful, wonderful experience I can think of. What year, what year is this? this is the eighties? Uh, Eighty three. So, what was the industry like at that time? Because it was, I mean, there was this, there was a slump going on, and I mean, was it starting to? crawl its way out of it or was what it, was happening was is really MTV was just starting to do their 10 second IDs which were a proving ground for a lot of independent animators and and kudos to them for doing that that way you know they could have conceivably maybe struck a deal with one studio to do a multiple group of these things but they for for just about each and every one of those 10 second IDs that all surrounded the MTV logo. You do whatever you wanted as long as you ended with the logo and, and did something fun and interesting. Um, they got such a variety of techniques, of approaches, of sensibilities, and people started looking at animation a little bit differently. There's also a guy um, 
Richard Williams, who deserves a lot more credit than he's given, and a lot of people don't even know who he is. Oh, they all know who he is here. <laughs> they should. They definitely should. But he was working in the UK. He's Canadian, but he was working in the UK, and he was doing these serial and other types of commercials. And all of a sudden, you started seeing this incredibly well-crafted, well-drawn, well-animated, well-staged and boarded stuff. And the, the sensibility with the existing studios at that point was, eh, you know, people aren't going to know the difference. You just crank it out. So people did know the difference. And he, I think he was responsible for a lot of studios going under because they couldn't keep up with that level of, of quality. And suddenly all these people that were kind of my age, maybe a little older, were or and even younger actually, were in a position to start to contract work and start to to um, hire people to do animation. And they'd grown up with animation. They had a soft spot in their heart for animation and they really wanted to see good stuff. And um, this old rule of kids don't know the difference and so forth suddenly started falling to the wayside and people started getting off on animation again. MTV had a lot to do with it in those early years. And, um, and now, all the cartoons that you do see that are like 2D, um, Cell, whatever it's called, um, it, it's mostly parody. It's mostly a takeoff on an old cartoon. I mean, everything from Family Guy to SpongeBob to all these things are, you know, 2D is like the old visual vocabulary that you use to now, it seems, do kind of, you know, satire and parody. And it's well, interesting. Well, and I was going to say that there's so much satire in your, in the studio's work. And in order to do satire convincingly, you really have to know your stuff. You have to know, you kind of have to know your history. Yeah, uh, so. well, I like history a lot. I like, so, um, I love how influences um, affect uh Things, which is what being an influence is all about, isn't it? Um, I, I, I enjoy um, being able to also kind of lead people down one path and kind of go the other way. So parody is wonderful for that. Um, and I also understand uh, nostalgia very well. I have, everyone has their own personal nostalgia and it's like a narcotic. Uh, and I know how it can, um, kind of make you see things that aren't there. Like, you know, you look at Scooby-Doo and go, oh, it's wonderful. You know, it's like that. <laughs> um, Cartoon Network has been very good at taking um, bankrupt animation and reinventing it and representing it and making it. And, 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 and it's great because those same people at Cartoon Network who did that, the same people who at Nickelodeon did it with Nick at Night with the live action series stuff. So it's geniuses of uh, marketing. So when you were first starting out the studio, you and, and Patrice Settlemeyer, who um, is co-owner. Uh, My other better yes. <laughs> half. Now, when you, were, when you were starting out the studio, what kind, of, what kind of gigs were you getting initially before things really took off? Do you remember your first? The first job was a demo, which is a demonstration portion in a commercial of mouthwash going over teeth for ACT. Um, and then, um, but what really set the studio off was getting the package of things for Nickelodeon when Nicktoons started. We did the um, station IDs and we actually did the film that was presented within Turner to pitch the idea of a cartoon network, which was very interesting to be involved in. Um, but I had worked in um, a few studios, and one studio in particular called The Ink Tank, um, that I was able to, I had made a lot of contacts. I had gone from being an assistant animator to an assistant animator and then an animator, but then I was made a producer, which was very frustrating to me initially, but um, Patrice was very good at 
kind of waking me up to the fact that being a producer was going to give me the overall picture. My frustration came because I was just starting to animate. I was just starting to get my fingers really dirty and, and, and really concentrate on one thing. But you couldn't deny what pro uh, producing was going to give me. So then I represented the studio. And then I started directing stuff. And so by the time I had left the ink tank and we opened our own place, I was very well versed. And you it worked was, your way up to guru. Or, yeah, to guru, right, <laughs> yeah. But the Nickelodeon package kind of put us on the map, and then we got some work for 7-Up, and, and it just took off. All right. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, and uh, so if anybody has one, there's a mic there. There's a mic over there. There's uh, a Michael there. And that right there. <laughs> Hi. So, uh, what does JJ stand for? Good animation. Um, obviously, I've never been asked that question before. Um, John Joseph, you'll all have to die before you leave this room now because you're not allowed. Um, hi. I was I was really impressed by the variety of styles that you use, and you can't answer that question because you obviously are a student and you love animation. Uh, when it comes to commercials, are those ideas usually your ideas, it seemed that you, it's like you, sometimes, I mean, from the real, it looked like you were taking on projects because you wanted to experiment with a different style or a different variety of styles. So I was kind of curious about that interaction, especially with commercial companies. The, the commercials are never my idea or concept. Now, that doesn't mean that the, the concept doesn't come to the studio in a variety of different ways. Sometimes it might be a sentence. Uh, other times it'll come with a full-fledged storyboard and, and sometimes the storyboards are actually very good. Um, you're, you're very perceptive in terms of, although you know, obviously I put this reel together for a purpose to try to show you as many different techniques and styles as possible. Um, because I don't consider animation to be any one thing. But the uh, commercials are wonderful because they offer you an opportunity to work in so many different styles. And the trick is to marry a, a, a graphic vocabulary with sound, with the type of animation that's right for it. And... Um, um, that's the fun, that's the uh, challenge, and the other thing that's nice about commercials is that it's, it, it's like this intense, you have this little repertory company that does little different things each time, so you get to try different stuff, you get to, you get to stretch your, uh, um, your talents. Um, but the way, the way commercials and advertising works is you, you usually have an advertising agency that represents a client, and then within the agency you have a producer, you have an art director, and a copywriter, and they all have different tasks and things that they contribute. And your, your objective is to try to solve their problems and translate their concept into animation. And there are times when I've received concepts that look like they have no business being animated. And um, if it looks like it's, I, I've been doing stuff long enough to know that if it looks like it's going to be a disaster to try to make something work that just, just doesn't have the ingredients in it, um, I really do try to get them to explain to me what it is that they're choosing to, and why they're choosing to, to animate it. It doesn't happen that much anymore, though, and I think that has to do with age and understanding and the generation understanding animation now better than people possibly prior. Over here. Um, one of those um, reels they showed had, um, was it Candy and Pops walking at the movie show? Did you have anything to do with the what is it called? The intermission or was it previews for Aqua Teen Hunger Force the movie? You know how? No. No. 
It looks just like, okay, and they must have stolen your animation because. No, I, I that, that <laughs> spot, um, which we did for a, uh, uh, it wasn't done for an advertising agency. It was done for a friend of mine who works at an advertising agency in, in Texas. And it's actually the second church spot we had done uh, for him. Um, but this, when he explained to me that the church wanted something for their website to advertise and promote the fact that they had taken an old theater and made it into a church, I realized that I could not only have fun with this, but since I've been in the industry, I have often been asked, you ever have, you have one of those kind of gone out to the lobby things that they used to have in the, that, it, it, it's, it's such a cliche that, uh, and we tried to copy it as, as closely as possible to the original um, so that it really was a good, you know, uh, parody and, and spinoff. But the fact that we could not only do a, um, um, a thing that was based on an old piece, but also spin it with a religious, um, and, and, and encouraged to do so by the church, by the way, uh, it was just a great opportunity to do something that people have been asking for for years. Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Do you guys know Aqua Teen Hunger Force? That's one of those shows that I just goes right over me. <laughs> and it is so ugly. <laughs> and it's not bad ugly. It's not good ugly. It's just wrong ugly. <laughs> and it not only looks ugly, but that video, crisp, sharp, it's like you can't even do drugs and appreciate it. Because <laughs> you think somebody's done something to you when you're watching it. It's just, I just, there's one of those things I try to be so open and go, oh, you know, there's probably some, no, no, just I just don't get at. it. Just don't get it. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Frank Mares, and I was wondering if you have like a proudest animation, and also if you do like private, personal animations for friends or relatives. Or... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that you could talk um, about. Proudest, proudest meaning what I've done that I'm most proud of? Yeah. Um, th it, it's... That Tribune stuff was such a jo such a joy to work on. I mean, I grew up I grew up in Evanston in Chicago, first of all. So to have the opportunity to be a part of something like that, and to also um, be given the opportunity and the and the flexibility and the encouragement to do something that's all performance based like that. There's no soundtrack, I mean, in terms of voice track, there's no voice track. It's all, you know, Chaplin and Keaton, and and oh, it was just, and it was a lovely amount of work. I mean, there were, we must have done 12 commercials, and not only that, but had, I, we were branding the newspaper, and, and, and it, I got to personally design the thing, and see it on, on trucks, on, you know, the boxes that sell the paper, flying into O'Hare and seeing the billboard from you know ten thousand feet and still being able to understand it because it's so simple, uh, that was really even tonight I was looking at it going God that really was a landmark thing, and that other spot for the Chicago um, film Children's festival Fest yeah the Children's Film Festival. Um, kind of along what you were saying earlier, the reason I wanted to do that was because Eddie Guy, the artist who had designed the posters, who designed the visuals for that, um, I'd always wanted to do something with him because I couldn't, for the life of me, figure out how something like that could be animated, and I wanted, I wanted an opportunity to try it out. So when that came up, it was a pro bono spot, meaning that it was for free, and um, right after we started working on that, I asked the producer at the advertising agency to kind of keep your ears open if there was anything else going on, 
um, that we could get involved in to kind of offset the fact that there was no budget on this. She called the next day and said, I just found out that the agency is going to pitch the Tribune, Chicago Tribune business. It would, and would you like, and they want to do something animated. Would you want to be involved with that? You know, after I got up off the floor, uh, I said yes. Um, and that meant that I'd be involved from the very, very, very beginning with the advertising agencies. So everything about it was ideal. And it took six months before we actually started doing some animation on it. It was all planning and, and so forth. So it was, that, was, that was a good one. Hi. <clears throat> Advertising is, uh, seems to be part of your family and in, in your blood. Can you talk about um, your father and maybe some of the influences that he's had on you? I know you grew up in advertising, so to speak. I grew up in advertising, so to speak. My father is Joe Settlemeyer. Uh, he did Where's the Beef, not the stuff that's on now. He did the original Where's the Beef um, uh, work for Wendy's. He uh, did the Federal Express spots that um, uh, his, his contribution um, was in casting. And at a time in the 60s and 70s when most commercials were cast with plastic looking people, he cast normal people, not deformed people, <laughs> like people who would rip him off would use, or, or use fisheye lens or wide angle lens. No, it was, it was just using normal people. And I think his influences became my influences. W.C. Fields, you heard me mention Keaton and Chaplin before. Um, and, and, and actually he uh, was interested in being a cartoonist himself. I mean, and I grew up reading his comic books, which he kept, which could probably put many children through school now in terms of their value. <laughs> and you were not allowed to bend them back, so they're all in pristine, you know, mile-high shape. Um, but uh, and, and I would go with him um, and to the advertising agencies uh, on weekends when he would be working and I'd be hanging out there and if he was shooting his own films, I'd often have a chance to you know, be a part of that. So it was, a wonderful, um, it was a wonderful way to grow up. And the exposure I had to stuff was you know, terrific, really, really good. And it's nice. It's, it's, it's nice to have been a part of um, something that really changed um, an industry. His casting was just, and, and he also always did it in Chicago. At a time when they said, you know, well, I'll come out to California, or oh, I'll come out to New York. He wanted to stay in Chicago. And uh, that was good for people getting jobs here too. Um, yes, another question, and I hope I didn't see wrong, but Ooh. most of your reels seem to be flat animation, 2D animation. Well... But, but there was a spot right in the beginning which seemed to be models. Speedy so Alka-Seltzer? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, was it something you're doing less of or you experimented with? And well, first of all, a lot of the stuff, like the Tribune work, I don't like the thing to be to to drip of, you know, trying to figure out what te technique we use to do it. It should just like seem right. Um, but the Tribune uses Flash, Maya, um, uh, the uh, sh the Chicago Children's Film Festival is After Effects. Um, the Speedy Spot um, was done. I, I involved a, a studio called Frame Store. They do the Geico Lizard because this really needed to be performance based. And we weren't, Speedy was originally done stop motion, herky jerky kind of. And uh, um, I'm, I'm just into doing whatever is going to do the most justice to the, the concept. Um, people don't. People don't think of me or us as a uh, as, as being as doing CG work, but um, it's really using CG is no different than using uh, 
Gary Baseman for the cruise spot or uh, another designer. It's just what is your visual vocabulary, you know, and, and do you understand it well enough to be able to uh, execute it? Thank you very much. <laughs> hey there. Um, I was just wondering um, if you've ever had like a moment where you present, you know, your big product to a client and they're like, oh, not quite. Like, and, and how do you, how do you respond to that? How do you rise up from <laughs> that? That never happens to you, does it? Um, yeah, sure, it's happened. I mean, don't, and my hesitation is not whether it's happened. I'm trying to think of the best story of, of one that's, uh, um, not so much, it's not so much, it hasn't been so much that, um, it's the the wrong idea that I'm presenting because that really hasn't uh, that 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 really hasn't happened in terms of falling flat on my face with you know like blank look it's looks and crickets and no no no, no. but what has happened is um, a presentation where people weren't really honest about how they felt and you found out first of all too late in the process um, for whatever reason sometimes and I try to be really clear about what the process is how it works and, and the approval process and all that but um, or sometimes a concept there may be a change by the client and they have to tell the advertising agency who we're working directly with what the change is. And the client thinks that this is a not a, not a big deal. You know, I just wanna I just wanna make sure that people realize that the liver is only affected by this product when there's a full moon or something like that. <laughs> and so by th that comment throws everything up for grabs and there's, a, there's a, a concept change and the agency doesn't want to let me really know. They wanna try to just make it seem like it's a small revision and then you realize that there's a bigger thing behind it. Um, the, 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 I think you learn after a while how to um, open things up enough so that the communication is, is good enough for something. You really aren't going to end up presenting something that's so off the wall. Like I wouldn't present uh, something dark and edgy uh, to someone who I have already asked a backstory about, you know, what's your client like and, and who are they trying to reach. And so, so no, it really hasn't been... Um, disastrous there but there have been times when and it's usually somebody who comes into the process who wasn't there in the beginning um, there have been those kind of awkward moments when you have to try to figure out how to sort things out um, I wish I had a better story for that but uh, well actually and there was this one thing we, we did. We did a series of commercials for uh, George Brown, which was an investment company. These commercials involved caricatures of the actual George Brown done by a, a character artist, a character artist uh, David Levine. A lot of detail, a lot of cross-hatching, a lot of really intricate work. And um, when they had played me his voice, uh, before we started working on the commercial, this voice had a lot of character to it. And I said, ooh, can I come to the voice record? I'd like to videotape him because it really sounds like he has a lot, he moves around a lot. I can tell just by the way his voice sounds. Went to the voice record, videotaped him, brought the videotape back, and we used it as research. We didn't trace it. We didn't rotoscope it that way. We just watched little ticks he had and little stretches and, so, and with all this detail it became wonderful drawing and so we finished the animation and the agency loved it we were very proud of it and they showed it to George Brown and he freaked and it was the whole idea behind this was the idea was buy low and he was low in the screen 
and he would stretch his neck up and look above the edge and so forth. Well, by the time he got through it, because he said, oh, I should have never let him videotape me. I mean, I, I look like a turkey and it is all this kind of stuff. And he even kind of looked like maybe at one point he might have had a small stroke because his, his, <laughs> his mouth was kind of lazy. But it was great to capture that in the animation and character, you know, it's because it, it made the voice sound more real because you were drawing it the way it was being acted in real life. By the time he got through of it, the head, you know, was originally up here. The head was, and it, luckily it didn't affect the concept, but there was all this great drawing down here that no one ever got to see except on our director's cut. So that's the closest I can come to one of those weird moments. Thanks. Uh, JJ, I enjoyed watching your reel, um, but I was struck by the diversity of style. And I think about other animators, and I wonder, would you describe, would you say that there is a Settlemeyer style? And if there is, how would you describe it? No. I wouldn't say there's a Settlemeyer style other than um, the, the right mix of those elements I was talking about before in terms of graphic vocabulary and sound and message and type of animation. Um, and, you know, what the reason we stopped doing the Saturday Night Live stuff is because we got ourselves branded by our own title card. Uh, that title card we didn't have until the, I think, the middle of the second season. Um, there were always titles at the end, but um, this title card, um, really kind of cemented in people's brain that that kind of shitty animation in that old style but very funny was J.J. Settlemeyer. And so I thought, oh boy, we're in trouble now because that's all they think we do. Because people and are then, just going to associate you with crappy animation. <laughs> crappy animation. But, uh, and, and, and that in itself can be nice and fine to do that kind of stuff, but that's not all we wanted to do. And until we can get that title card on the end of a commercial, you know, it's not, and I've been able to do it once in a while, but it, it be, we ran away from it and, and tried to do as much PR about the fact that, you know, we're no longer doing Saturday Night Live and, and the studio does all this. Well, screw that. I mean, up and to this day, people think we've done every single one of those cartoons and we, and we haven't. And I would uh, periodically say to Robert, please make sure the cartoons are good because everyone's thinking we're doing them anyway. <laughs> um, so th there's my, my, um, I really want to just make sure we're always doing the best possible version of what it is that we're doing, that we're using those elements properly and, and, and really doing animation well by it. It's really a drag to see shitty stuff on television. As long as I'm up here, I just have a totally unrelated question. Uh, what do you think of Mad Men? Um, I, it took me a while to take to it, but my daughter got uh, me to watch it. I resisted it because, oh God, they got a clip-in phone cord on that, and they only had hardwired phone cords back then, and it just, you know, it's like time to get a life much. Uh, once I got into it, it was great. I really, I do enjoy it. I'm looking forward to it come, coming back. And John Hamm does a mean ace. He was born to play ace. Uh, I don't know if Jimmy Fallon was born to play Gary, but yeah. Oh. Um, but, but we can hear you. Yeah. Alex Ross did the cover of our comic book um, that uh, we're coming, we've, we've kind of run that comic book out and we're going to publish another, a second edition of the comic book soon and I got Neil Adams to do the comic. So those are like my two uh, favorite comic book artists and probably many people's favorite comic book artists. But we started the studio with the idea of doing commercials with print artists that aren't known for being um, animated by any uh, means. 
it, 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 it there's this wonderful talent pool out there of uh, design, illustration, um, cartooning, whatever you want to call it, that is wonderful to translate into animation. Um, and the process is always different. So um, I've, I've worked with George Booth from The New Yorker. I've worked with Al Hirschfeld. I've worked with Maurice Sendak. I worked, the Ink Tank, the studio I used to work at, was run by R.O. Blackman, who was, you should know who he is because he influenced uh, um, cartoon illustration. It's little squiggly, modest little characters. Uh, and Don Martin from Mad Magazine. I mean, and I don't just like meet him, I collaborate with them. I, How much oh, they have as much input as they want. If they, like that George Brown commercial I was telling you about, David Levine, we were not allowed to contact him because the advertising agency uh, didn't want to have to pay extra. So we were given ads that he had done. And I had books on David Levine. He just died. Yeah. And he had macular degeneration. Oh, man. Well, horrible for an artist. Um, but we sent him the spot after I finished it. And I called him and I said, we animated your stuff and I'm not supposed to show it to you. He said, oh my heavens, why would you want to do that? <laughs> and uh, no, to, to be able to know and collaborate and actually in s many cases be friends with these people, it's just, oh, if you told me that when I was in high school, get the. It's probably on our, on our website. Yeah, Brown and Company. Gary Trudeau, a lot of Garys. All, of, all the Garys. <laughs> yeah, um, I was just wondering uh, what some of your old favorite cartoons were, and also um, if there are any like if there's any modern uh, animations that you're paying attention to, or like oh. what are you watching these days? If you if there's anybody here interested in animation, you have to get up to Ottawa. Ottawa is the best festival in the world. Annecy is fine. <laughs> Yawn. Fine. <clears throat> um, but Ottawa, I think, is the best. Uh, and it's, it's, it's oh, very uh, independent. You know, you've got the recruitment going on up there uh, by the larger studios, but it's not you know, a basis for the, for the festival. Uh, you get to meet the filmmakers. You get to see what's going on out there, all different techniques. So definitely get up to Ottawa, and that's where I see a lot of the stuff. I also, um, there's a site called Cartoon Brew, uh, Amida Amidi and Jerry Beck. Um, I see a lot of stuff on there that I wouldn't see otherwise. Um, and sometimes I send them stuff that I've seen that I don't know that they've seen yet. So... Uh, Cartoon Brew is a, another good source. My favorite cart, well, besides the Superman stuff, um, I mean the Warner Brothers stuff. Uh, Disney was fine, but um, you don't laugh at Disney. You kind of go, awe or, oh, the deer died, I hate myself. And, <laughs> you know, that it... it you know, does that to you. But the Warner stuff and the MGM stuff and the Tex Avery stuff, uh, wherever he was working, except for maybe Lance, um, that stuff is just out of this world. Magical maestro. Oh, my God, with Tex Avery. And I didn't see any of this stuff until after I moved to New York. We didn't have this stuff in Chicago. I think Tom and Jerry was on once in a while, but I never really saw Tom and Jerry until I moved to New York in 1979. But all, all, the, all those cartoons were always on uh, in Chicago on, in the afternoons. When okay. Well, when, I when, used to come home and watch cartoons yeah. in the afternoons. No, I remember Sometimes seeing I used to watch those, cartoons during the, the day. All the Tex Avery stuff. Yeah. Never saw Tex really? Avery or realized it was yeah. Tex Avery. All the cartoons I saw were usually on Ray Rayner on Channel 9, Dick Tracy. Yeah, the, got the only horrible work UPA ever did. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, and, and you, the, the movie cartoons then, you know, it was, it was bad, Pink Panther and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but they were showing good stuff in New York when I moved to New York. So those are the ones that really, 
And there was a show on PBS when I was in school called the the International Animation Film Festival, I think. Gene Marsh hosted it, and I got to see stuff um, and a lot of Eastern European stuff. A lot of flying people in Eastern European animations, all this kind of they all wanted escaping. to escape. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was a good source. And then Asifa. If, you, if you're interested in animation, there's Asifa, which is the International Animation Guild, and they have festivals and competitions, and you get to meet people, and they have chapters all over the country and the world. Thank you. Uh, hi, JJ. It's great to see the spectrum of your work and to hear you talk about it. I just wanted to ask a question about um, the uh, network TV corporate musical piece that you, was in your, in your reel. Um, I found that really provocative and entertaining. The and conspiracy theory rock? Yeah, okay. yeah. Can you? I'd love to hear a little bit more about the genesis from that project and also just kind of what your take is from, as somebody who works within, you know, your career is bound up with a advertising, obviously, um, and just kind of working from within that, that structure. Is it politically? How do you... Um, within advertising? Yeah. Um, I guess I'm, what I'm asking is... Um, it seemed kind of like a rage against the machine from within the belly of the beast, and I don't know if I'm reading that into it. Or... The, the conspiracy theory rock was? Yeah. Yes, very much so. And when we were doing it, and there's a great story or two with that one, because when we were doing it, we are going, how is this going to get on the air? And that was the, that was the first Schoolhouse Rock parody that we did. We did one for The Daily Show, as well. But we did the first series of school, actual Schoolhouse Rock cartoons when they came back into being done. It was right after we did Beavis and Butthead, so it was like, um, <laughs> it was like I was gonna say jumping into a pool of cold water. No, it's like jumping into a pool of wonderful warm water. <laughs> um, the Conspiracy Theory Rock cartoon, uh, I think is the only well, it's certainly the only cartoon that aired in New York, but mysteriously did not make the feed to Los Angeles. <laughs> and I think it's about the time when, you know, it actually gets pulled off the air that the NBC executives in various parts of the country were having shit hemorrhages and going, you <laughs> know. Um, it was so weird to have the thing... Um, taken off the air when in the cartoon it gets taken off the air. And the, 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 the magazine The Nation did a piece on, you know, NBC um, uh, self-censoring. Uh, and, um, and Bill Moyers did a thing on censorship where they actually used, you know, an example. It's like it went through all the approvals. Wow. But I don't think the approval process, you know, made it to, um, was it Bob Wright? president hmm. and um, uh, it just uh, you couldn't you couldn't see it any place for a, for the longest time in uh, internet hmm. and then when NBC finally released their compilations of the cartoons they they put it in there to their to their credit I mean it's because it's scathing and in fact you can hear you can hear kind of the the audience zoning out because it has such a strong message it has so much content yeah. and it's not you know humphrey bogart farting it's <laughs> really issues yeah. going on and you kind of hear them you know zone out and then when it gets yanked off the air they you know seem to wake up but uh yeah that was an incredible um spooky yeah it's no, really spooky it was really provocative and great and just you know I the, the content's really important, but I guess what I'm wondering is if if it reflects your kind of political views at all, and if you've ever grappled with the contradiction of being somebody who does client-based work and has to sell products, and then also has to work within this system of, you know, networks that censor certain content, certain ideas that that get out there, and I, if you know what I mean, I and we haven't had too much of a problem coming to terms with the work that we've done. There are, I mean, we've, we've done anti-smoking stuff, but we, have, we won't do like advertising for cigarettes. Mm -hmm. and, there, and we've mm -hmm. turned down SNL, mm -hmm. what was it, the singing vagina? Yeah, I didn't 
Yeah, that wasn't. <laughs> um, uh, so, and you know, to tell you the truth, we, for the longest time, we did the quilted northern spots. Uh, and I just found out now that the Koch brothers own, um, I guess, Georgia Pacific. And that makes me feel weird. Hmm. I mean, I wouldn't want to do anything that they had anything to do with hmm. um, because they smoke cigarettes. Hmm. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's... It, it, and I wouldn't animate. I wouldn't an, animate um, Muhammad. Smigel mm. wanted to do that, and mm. I wouldn't do it. Mm. There was just too much craziness yeah. involved in that. Okay. So, but in turn, I, I, I can't think of anything that we've run across in advertising. Um, it was working for military things becomes kind of tricky. Uh huh. Yeah. We, yeah. Through the ad council. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, recruitment. That'd be squirrely. That'd be pretty squirrely. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. I don't like the way you said interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so given, given the wide range of techniques that you've had to play with, is there... Is there one out there? Like, is there is there a, a style or a technique or a look out there that you've always wanted to try and you've just it hasn't the opportunity hasn't rose yet? What? I can't. Um, I can't think of anything offhand that because I used to have like with the Eddie Guy Chicago Film Festival Children's Film Festival post there were there were spots like, but I was able to kind of quench it by actually you know being able to do stuff like that um, there's it, it's not that it's not out there to do it's just I I've uh, I've had such wonderful opportunities to do all this different stuff that now it's like doing variations of that but it's also trying to find people to collaborate with, and often it's writers now I look with. The guy who did Captain Linger, I just love Captain Linger, and I love <laughs> to hear people squirm, and, and, and the British get it so much better than the Americans get it. But it's funny showing Captain Linger to an advertising, like if I show it on a reel with, uh, at agencies, because as soon as he lands in the title sequence and nothing happens, the laughter starts. In... <laughs> In kind of a, a, a mixed group, it takes a little while. But in advertising, you know, if something doesn't happen, right like that, they there's something. Panic. It's wrong. Hey, what's up? Um, so, I love the Captain Linger. Stuart Hill, um, who was working at Cartoon uh, Network at the time, that was his idea, and we hadn't worked together before. And a producer at Cartoon. Uh, got in touch with me and said, there's a guy here who likes your work. He'd love to work with you. He has this idea of the superhero who's kind of clueless. And so I, was talk I got to talk to Stuart about it. And he, his vision of Captain Linger was kind of like a Rocky and Bullwinkle, um, Dudley Do-Right sort of style. And when I thought about it, I, I could see it, but I also thought that if it looked funny you would be saying to the people, okay, this is gonna be funny. It looks funny and you're conditioned and animation's got baggage that comes with it sometimes, it's really crazy. But if you recognize a style, you think it's going to behave a certain way. And I didn't wanna telegraph with Captain Linger that something funny or weird was gonna happen because I thought there were some really amazing subtleties that I had never seen in animation that were going to be an opportunity to try. And so I thought, well, instead of like a Rocky and Bullwinkle, what about if it were this kind of Kurt Swan, Superman, adequate drawn animation that appears harmless and just looks like it's out of a comic book? And people won't really know how to go with that. So when things start going terribly wrong, they'll be off balance to kind of begin with. And, it'll, and sure enough, that's the way 
it ended up working out. And there are, oh, the squirm factor is just so <laughs> wonderful. It's just like, why am I being subjected to this? It's just, what's going on here? He doesn't get it. And this is before like the American Express Superman, Jerry Seinfeld, Superman's a regular guy stuff that was being done. This, there, there wasn't anything like that being done. So it was really uh, fun to be a part of. Really, really great. So s writers, I love finding writers who I can work with now and, and start to sculpt things with. And Stuart's probably my favorite. That line in there where he says, some of the other superheroes already don't like him. <laughs> I mean, talk about terribly wrong. I mean, that's just like a sentence gone awry. <laughs> but it's just great. He has such a spin on stuff that's so weird. It's great, it's very unique. So has, um, I know you wanted to get past the, the SNL stuff so that you wouldn't get you know, labeled or uh, you know, pigeonholed. Uh, but has that opened a lot of doors in terms oh, of being able to work with different writers? Well, it's opened doors because there's this club of people. It's like a combination of um, uh, The Onion, because a lot of them actually are from Madison. I mean, the, the Colbert crew um, are ex-Onion people, and Rich Dom and... Um, two or three other of the writers who were there. Um, and so there's that group, and then there's um, uh, the people who, well, The Daily Show and Colbert, it's, it's all the same thing. There's like this club of, of writers and creatives that are just fantastic, and, and they not only work as writers, but they work as performers as well. Um, and and it's a very kind of welcoming in sort of scenario. There's, there's no kind of you're working for us sort of thing. You all work together. So it's a really good working um, kind of situation. And the SNL stuff was a great proving ground to show people um, what was possible with animation. And it opened doors in advertising. It opened doors in um, stuff on the web. I mean, it's really, it, it helped establish the studio. Question. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate on um, Beavis and Butthead, and now that it's back on MTV, if you could talk about uh, if Wait, you have any involvement with that. It's back on MTV? Yep. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we were the only studio left that was probably stupid enough to do that crazy project. Because I would even get calls from other friends at studios when we were, um, they found out we were talking to MTV and seriously talking to MTV about doing it. Um, great studios like Colossal Pictures in San Francisco and you know, I, Drew Takahashi would call me and say, are you out of your mind? You know, we know what it's going to be. So we had been opened just about a year. And I knew the people at MTV because I had done the IDs with them. And um, uh, if it had happened, it was the best thing in the world that could have happened to us because it taught us early on what we never wanted to do again. And if it had happened maybe six or seven years later, we might have thought that, okay, this is a natural progression. This is what we should be doing, you know, and, and now we got a big project and now we're gonna have a series and all. Um, it, we went from five people. Six to 62 in one week. Yeah, six to 62 in one week. How about that? Patrice is going through the final contract in the recovery room when our-, our we were in labor for a few months on that project. <laughs> no, it was, and the best part, and I, st and, and I have the original model sheets signed off by Mike Judge. They are dated April of 93. We started working on the project on November 28th, 1992. We did our last, delivered our last bit of animation, I believe it was in the middle of May, end of May, 1993. We had final signed off model sheets in April of 93. 
<laughs> um, and that kind of, we did 120 minutes of animation, the first, second seasons um, in about six months, no pencil tests, um, all digital, meaning it was all drawn, scanned. The backgrounds were pastels. When MTV did all the stuff, it was all cell. But we, this was early digital ink and paint and compositing. Um, John Whitney, had, who was a pioneer in this technique, had a studio in California called US Animation, and we used them. Um, there's no other way they could have gotten that done. Um, and so, but by the time we were done with what we did, we were ready to go on to other things. And, and it seemed to be a mutual feeling. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was a good experience. It really was a great experience. And a lot of people uh, got experience out of it. And MTV Animation basically opened up with the majority of the people that we had working on Beavis. So the New York animation industry went And that feels good, too. A lot of people are working in the industry because they got their start on Beavis. Um, and the way it started was Mike had done the, the, the two cartoons that he did. They aired on Liquid Television, which was the show, great show, um, that Colossal Pictures was producing for MTV. It was a composite of appropriated stuff, and Ian Flux started on there, and really, really great uh, proving ground for a lot of things. They showed it there, and they, I guess it, they got a lot of reaction positively off of these crazy cartoons. So they decided to do focus group testing on Beavis and Butthead before they would decide to go into a series sort of situation. So they tested it around, and they found out that it was a kind of Three Stooges sort of thing, where the guys liked it, but the girls didn't like it, except in New Jersey. <laughs> And I don't know what else to say, how to elaborate. I don't know whether it's the water table or what's going on, but uh, Jersey Shore, I guess, huh? Thank you. Question in the middle? Robert? Uh, yeah. can, uh, can you use the mic or hand them? That way it's recorded for posterity. Oh, that's right. Forever and ever. You have to uh, say your question again. How long does a, a uh, commercial actually take from pitch to completion? And during that process, are there any um, artistic struggles that take place but between, I guess, just in, in your mind as far as what you actually like to produce? Well, first of all, the time frame it it differs. Sometimes we've had to do a commercial in two weeks. Uh, sometimes we've had 12 weeks. Uh, sometimes it depends on um, um, how intricate the animation needs to be and, 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 the, 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 and you really need a reasonable time to do a good job and so forth. But other times you gotta figure out how to fit it in within a schedule that you know, you're, you're given. Um, often the airing slot has been bought before there's been maybe a responsible enough of thought put together as to how it's going to get done. So your objective is to, and that's frankly the kind of stuff I like to be given a challenge like that, to try to figure out how to make it work. If there's no way possible, I, I'll say that, but there's often a way of, of pulling it off. Um, Struggle? Yeah, there's struggle, but that's why you find finding the people that you can work with and that seem to get you, not just like your work, but you're on the same wavelength. You want to take those people and you want to kidnap them and take them with you wherever you go because the, that means that not only will you um, enjoy the process, but ultimately the work's going to be better because you're being supported, encouraged, and they've chosen you to do something that you, they feel you'll do best anyway. Uh, but there are always struggles. 
Sometimes it's, you know, personal struggles that you thought maybe you thought you had things figured out and you didn't and you struggle with it. Other times you've got um, the people that you're doing the work for that are throwing you curves left and right and, and aren't making your life easy. And I produce my own work. I don't have a producer that acts as a go-between because it just doesn't seem necessary. And it often can make things complicated. So there's sometimes a struggle because people don't want to talk to the creative person either about money or schedule or they don't want to have to tell the person directly, the director, that they don't like something. So sometimes it just happens to be the way we do things that can even cause a struggle. But uh, just get through it. Good, thanks. Just get through it. Well, um, Jonah, did you have a question? Yeah, I had one Last other one. question. I wanted to ask, um, what was it like working with Stephen Colbert? It's always wonderful working with Stephen Colbert. He's an amazing talent. He's very supportive. He's, uh, and we've done, you know, we, we first worked together with him doing the voice with Smigel, and then um, the Daily Show stuff, and then we did, he brought us in to do stuff with, they had a show called Strangers with Candy, um, and uh, we did the titles for that, and then we actually did the titles for his production company, Spartina, the, the bird at the end, let alone the Tech Jansen stuff. It's wonderful. Really, really great. And what a, you know, what a talent. What he does with that character. It's just amazing. So, uh, you know, we, we, do, we know Al Roker, too, and we actually have a series pending uh, with him at Disney. And he's another guy who's just fantastic to work with. And, oh, he loves animation. So um, I haven't run across too many... Um, assholes, really. <laughs> you know, it's kind of kind of lucky. It's uh, we've been very very fortunate, and all the artists that we worked with are just absolutely fantastic. It's a wonderful thing. Any uh, any last words for young animators out there? Um, Get out now! No. <laughs> No, I, you know, if you really like, if you really are interested in doing something and it's, there's nothing wrong with the whole time to get a life thing. It's really kind of a wonderful thing, especially when you find something that you are, uh, that, that gives back what this has given back to me. Uh, and, um, you know, getting into the community with not only animators, but artists and, and other people, I like to... I like to collaborate, and uh, if you like to collaborate, animation's a wonderful thing. And if, in terms of being a student, and you go out looking for work, um, just don't make anybody feel like you think you're God's gift to uh, anyone, because that's not collaborative. And we see a lot of portfolios, and we have a lot of people come in to visit the studio and have through the years. And we'll take somebody who looks like they're enthusiastic and can do and, and all that stuff uh, over the person who's got this drop-dead gorgeous portfolio but, you know, has an attitude that sucks. So, uh, and, and also the last thing I'll say, or another thing I'll say, is that uh, while you're trying to get started, uh, you might find yourself working someplace under circumstances that you thought are totally worthless and detrimental to your existence and all that. <laughs> the most valuable experience I had was when I was going to school in Madison and I worked in a Greek restaurant for two and a half years uh, started as a busboy, ended up as a manager, assistant manager, working in the disco, so that kind of tells you what time. Um, <laughs> I realized um, about 10 years later that, you know, working un under those circumstances and working with employees and working with people and vendors who 
who were uh, delivering stuff to the to the restaurant. And it taught me everything I needed to know about you know having a, a studio, and uh, it also being a bartender is a wonderful opportunity to get to know yourself. And if you're comfortable about how you deal with people, that really, that's a skill that's really valuable. And so if you find yourself working in a bookstore or a McDonald's or something like that, don't think you won't take that stuff with you and haven't learned something from it. You, 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 you'll use it. You'll use it. Get out of there as quick as you can, but you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's all handy stuff, so don't be too discouraged. But man, if you're interested in animation, get up to Ottawa. It does a lot of, accomplishes a whole bunch of stuff mm -hmm. in one, in one uh, journey. It's usually in October, September or October. September. Yeah. It just happened, because Meg was there and Devin was there, two of our yeah, faculty. That, that uh, you saw, it was an honor to do the, uh, the signal film. And we did five different ones for each night because I hated sitting through each and every, you know, it's so each way, the scenario was similar, but each time something strange happened, something different happened each night. So uh, it was nice. And I'm judging next year, so I'm really excited. All right. Well, um, before we uh, wrap up, uh, I realized there was a couple, uh, there were still people I wanted to thank. Uh, uh, First of all, obviously, Paloma Treka for uh, helping make this happen, and also all the animation faculty, all the students who uh, helped make this happen. And then also, I wanted to mention that JJ brought comic books. And uh, he, um, I don't know if we have enough to go around, so I'm, he said I should hand them out however I want. Uh, so I'm just first come, first serve. If you, the faster you can line up, uh, I'll go stand somewhere in the middle so that it's not uh, unfair to people in the back. <laughs> uh, the, and you can get one. And if you didn't get one and you want one, uh, let me know. Just email me and uh, I'll, try I'll to, shake I'll them down for one. Yeah, I'll try to uh, scrounge up some more. It's like the last run of uh, the Alex Ross comic book, and I just, you know, just kind of run out. But I, I tried to get together as many as I could before he came out. So we'll try to do you right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, JJ. Thank, Thank you, you, Patrice. Thank you very much. <laughs>